Hi everyone, welcome to the second part of beam design. We're going to be going through the remaining um, components that you need to understand to be able to design a beam, especially in terms of behavior and buckling. Now, here you'll see the equation for the, um, for the resistance linked to laterally unsupported beam. This is the elastic critical moment. And so this is a perfect beam experiencing bending. It'll fail at this moment. So this is an elastic failure. And so there are two parts to the um, resistance in the middle, St. Fernand torsion and warping torsion. And I do explain those in another video. But uh, what you will see with it, just as an illustration regarding warping torsion, uh, for various sections, this component is approximately zero. Either for, um, if you have a look at these two sections, a UB 254, 146, 31, and a 150, 150, 10 angle, you can see that they have roughly the same cross sectional area, but vastly different stiffnesses. Um, orders of magnitude different just because of the shape and how they resist warping. So we, we take this as approximately zero, the second one. And. Uh, also make sure you, now with MCR you understand what omega 2 is, what is the kappa value, what is our effective length. There's a, just an illustration regarding St. Fernand torsion and so when you twist a section that's sort of what the, the, the stress may look like and uh, same thing with warping torsion there, it has an illustration of how the section warps. We are now going to plot the change in bending resistance with the length of compression flange, looking at how long is our compression flange and how is buckling experience. And as per compression design, we have two main equations providing um, boundaries to the resistance. So for, we've got our elastic buckling, which we were just discussing. So this is our MCR value. MCR. And then we also have our plastic resistance. MP, and a real beam is going to fall below that. A real beam is going to first experience um, you know, plastic behavior, and it'll behave as a plastic section, and then it transitions into inelastic buckling, and then it be, uh, finally experiences elastic buckling here. And this is our MR, our moment of resistance, that orange curve. And that's what we're trying to generate uh, based on the beam specification. So once we know the length of compression flange, we start looking at the equations. And then depending on the relationship between MCR and 0.67 MP, we know which side of this we are. So do we use inelastic buckling or elastic buckling? And what you will find is with this um, equation here, uh, at the top, this actually can go above MP. So we will run the calculation. We might even find we get a, a result up there. And that's why you always check that your resistance is never higher than phi MP. And if it is, you just drop it down. So we've got three bounding, well, bounding equations, phi MP, MR is 1.15, etc. This is a fitted curve. You can't, you look at that and you think, where on earth does that equation come from? That simply joins a point there to a point there and describes the um, transition, the inelastic buckling that we get. MCR and the, the MP we can derive, but the middle bit is, is an equation joining those two values from here to here. And just remember, as I said, this is the length of the compression flange, not the tension flange. Tension flange doesn't buckle, compression flange buckles, so compression flange has to be designed. And when it comes to looking at the effective length of the compression flange, see the compression flange as a column. So if you were designing the section, let's say now there is the compression flange, how does this buckle sideways? How does that move and what does the boundary condition do to it? And so if we have an axis there, vertically at the sport, so it's in and out of the page at these positions, and it'll look as I've drawn that orange line there. If it can rotate about that vertical axis, so this, sorry, just here, these are plan views. So I'm looking down on top of my beam and saying, all right, I load it until it fails. What does it look like? And it, it twists and, and buckles sideways. Um, it experiences lateral torsional buckling. 
they see the top flange as a column and ask yourself, is it allowed to rotate at the sports? In most steel connections, it's, it's actually a pin connection, so it can rotate in plan. So it's rotating about that axis. But if we have some sort of fixity, it prevents that from rotating. So rotation about y-axis restraint, and it makes it much stronger. So you have a higher moment of resistance because your compression flange is less likely to buckle. And so you need to make sure that that doesn't happen. Well, you want to um, design for it. You want to make sure that your boundary conditions, your k-value matches, can something rotate in um, plan at these positions. And there are various ways of doing that. Here is now a, a, um, a cantilever beam looking at the effective length. So we do discuss this in other videos as well. Um, this is a simplified representation looking at the various um, conditions at root and at tip and how do we prevent the um, flange from well the beam from moving do we just have a top restraint and then it can still sort of rotate to some extent or do we have both and this prevents rotation or is it free to rotate altogether so uh, as you have more and more restraint you have a lower if effective length and you can see that's the general trend as it's being held in place more and more the effective length gets lower the strength goes up and your moment of resistance is highly dependent upon your KL value if you get your effective length wrong you will severely under or over predict the capacity of your beam so just be very careful when it comes to this and here are some just examples of different connections. So for instance, an elevation and plan, this is cast into concrete. This is very fixed at the support. And uh, this is continuous with lateral um, restraint against lateral and torsional. And so for instance, here is a, a some sort of concrete column, little packer on top, and you've got a web stiffener. So this web stiffener is preventing um, the section from moving sideways by adding in a, uh, a section there that's preventing movement. You've got these web stiffeners and this provides a sort of diaphragm wall action so it cannot move sideways from left to right. And uh, if you don't have that then you have continuous where only lateral support is provided and you end up with this situation and the, progress the effective length progressively increases as you have less and less support. So just be careful when determining your effective length using those. And so as I mentioned earlier, your omega-2 value heavily inf well, influences your MCR, your moment of your elastic critical moment. So this will have no influence on a short section, a plastic section, because a plastic section doesn't experience buckling. So a meter-long beam won't be affected by this, but a long beam will be affected by this. So just be careful and refer to the other video, specifically looking at how does the bending moment shape influence the resistance of a section because normally the load doesn't inf um, influence resistance in most structural design load does not influence resistance however in bending moments it does where the bending moment shape influences the buckling behavior of the section there are alternative ways of com calculating omega-2 that are more accurate and if and when SANS 10162 gets updated we may have an equation like this but uh, at the moment not and this takes into account the shape more accurately this is actually a better formulation of omega-2 but uh, it's also more complicated we're not going to uh, deal with this at the moment I'm just letting you know this um, exists and so you can use it but you don't need it for the course we do have we can use the more simplified code and red book equations. Final thing we're going to go through is the effective length of beams and this is the same example as we had last time where we did it in compression but now we're going to do it in bending and let's have a look at how we would analyze this. So ignore the compression loads we're just going to analyze this purely for bending and the first thing is is you will notice that this is a symmetric structure so you can take and, and just cut it in half and just think now how would this behave and bend well it can rotate there but it's symmetric so the the left hand side must match the right hand side so if I draw the deflected shape the deflected shape would look something like that mirror image around C and this is the same deflected shape as a prop cantilever there you go 
and uh, you can actually then model the structure with half the structure, so half the amount of, of work to, to analyze it. So you can have that with a point load at the middle, and from this you can now get the bending moment diagram a lot quicker, because you just have well, zero moment there, you've got, uh, all right, it looks, oh, I've got tension on the bottom, tension on the top, um, tension, tension, tension. Okay, so some point between the two they must swap. So I've got tension on the bottom, join that line, join that line. Okay, there's my bending moment diagram. I mean, we draw our bending moment on the tension face, so tension there, tension there. Just by looking at the diagram, you can see where the tension is, and somewhere around here it swaps. And so that actually gives us then the shape of the bending moment diagram. We now can start looking at the buckling behavior. And if we look at the top flange buckling and effective length, we have restraints all the way along. So the effective length of the top flange is going to be relatively small. Um, just all the way like that. So a typical L value is two and a half meters. And then we've got to see, well, is the load normal or destabilizing? The lo load is there. Can the top flange move? Uh, well, depending on where it is, but at the position of the load, the load cannot move sideways because there is a lateral support right there. So this is a normal load because the load cannot move sideways. So we've got a normal load, unrestrained in plan, unrestrained in plan, because you can see it, it rotates. So then you will get a normal load, unrestrained in plan, you'll get your effective length. Same thing now, we move on to our bottom flange. So uh, it can't move, can't move, can't move. So our buckling length increases. So that would be our buckled length. Um, it would sort of buckle about those positions. So now our L is five meters. And same thing though, normal load, um, et cetera, et cetera. And now we have two effective lengths, which is linked to the fact that the bending moment diagram actually crosses the um, sides. So each flange is in compression. So I've got a compression flange. Remember, we designed the compression flange. So there's a compression flange and there's a compression flange. Either of them could govern. And so I might need to check both of these just to see where um, which governs. If the, the longer length, so and has the higher moment, then it's easy. Longer length, higher moment. So you've got lower resistance, higher force. It'll obviously be that. But for instance, if you've got the higher force and the higher resistance, then you don't actually know which beam section will govern, so you will check both. Let's have a, a, another look at um, the effective length of beams. Here is our section once again, and just start thinking, what would happen to this if braced in weak axis side view? So here is our um, section, it's braced, and so the, um, the, the section goes into the page. The, um, as this is loaded, we'd first have to say, all right, what goes into compression? Compression tension, as the section bends over. All right, so that means the compression flange, the inner flange is now going to experience buckling. So this gets fixed at the bottom, pinned at the top. And so you've got a, un, um, a, a Unrestrained in plan, restrained in plan, and so you will actually find k equals half of restrained plus unrestrained. It's the average of the um, of the two, and uh, it's a bit more difficult when asking is this a normal or destabilizing load because the load's not on the beam. So when it buckles, the load's not there. But conservatively, what I would do, I'd say, well. If when this buckles, does it cause more twisting? And so if when this compression flange buckles, what happens, that load, this whole top section will swing out. There's nothing preventing it from swinging out. So then to me, it would be a, a destabilizing load. But for instance, if I had a lateral restraint there, then the load wouldn't move when I um, when it buckles. So uh, you just have to look at it quite carefully. When the compression flange buckles, does the twist get worse if it does destabilizing, if not normal? Um, so all right, if unbraced, same story once again. Here we now have a cantilever. There is strong axis buckling, and so the entire thing would do that. 
and you would design it as a cantilever. Question. What is the weak axis effect of length? How would it buckle if it was loaded, let's say, in and out of the, uh, into the page? Well, firstly, you sh hopefully by now should say there is no such thing as a weak axis effect of length. That's a trick question. The effect of length, a weak a section experience weak axis buckling does not buckle. So it doesn't have effective length. So it doesn't apply. You design it as a continuously naturally supported section. So you would just have your moment of resistance as your Z um, your Z elastic or Z plastic about the weak axis and you would design it that way. Okay, hope that was informative and uh, giving you the basis of beam design and you can refer to the rest of the videos for uh, more explanations. Thank you.